Good afternoon and welcome to this latest bulletin on the angry astronaut. In the news today, Rocket Lab carries out one of the most clandestine launches in U.S. history. A rocket launch that involved a suborbital vehicle. Doesn't sound all that interesting, but it turns out that this was the maiden launch of a vehicle that will provide a testbed for future top-secret hypersonic rockets and hypersonic space planes. Hello, and once again, welcome to The Angry Astronaut. Just want to make sure that I clarify a couple of things for the viewers before we plunge into this latest news from Rocket Lab. In regards to the latest content that I've been releasing on my channel, yes, there has been a preponderance of UAP-related content. And the reason for that is not simply because it's incredibly popular, although it is, and this is a business, and popular topics need my attention, but at the same time, there's just been a lot going on. We have a very, very prominent member or former member of the intelligence community saying some incredible things about UFOs, and we also have Dr. Avi Loeb dredging the bottom of the Pacific um, in the suspected crash site of an interstellar meteor, or maybe something that wasn't a meteor, all of this happening at the same time, and on top of that, a Another paper has just been published about Amuamua that I will be reporting on tomorrow. None of this means that I am shifting away from my traditional content on The Angry Astronaut. It just means that there's a lot of UAP-related stuff going on, and that's something that needs to be reported on. I'm not just going to let it go by because I'm supposed to be concentrating on space flight or anything else. And for those of you who say that I'm reporting on wacko concepts or whatever, I would remind you that just about everything I report on is backed up by a lot of verifiable information, whether it be peer-reviewed papers that have been published and reviewed and acknowledged as being legitimate, or for those cases that don't involve astronomical phenomena, we have some pretty reliable witnesses. But I will never report on an average member of the public saying that they saw 10 foot tall aliens in their backyard as happened recently in Las Vegas without any sort of verifiable proof. As far as I'm concerned, there's nothing to report on. So my channel will never drift into that category. Okay, enough of that. Let's get on with what's been happening with Rocket Lab. Now, one of the reasons that Rocket Lab has been so successful is because they are not relying exclusively on the electron or their ability to deliver payloads into low Earth orbit or beyond for a low price. This, for example, is a collaborative effort called the Winnebago between Rocket Lab and a company called Varda. Now, Varda is in the space manufacturing industry. They actually intend to manufacture some unique and very important pharmaceuticals in microgravity that cannot be manufactured under any other circumstances. This vehicle is based on the Rocket Lab Photon vehicle that's been used quite a number of times, but it isn't launched by the Electron. It's too heavy. As a result, it was actually loaded onto a rideshare mission with a SpaceX Falcon 9 and deployed that way, which means Rocket Lab was making money off of a SpaceX launch. As a matter of fact, they made substantially more money off of Varda than SpaceX did for the same mission. Now, the idea behind Varda's design, and by the way, this is something that's also being attempted by a company called Spaceforge out of Wales, is to manufacture products with an automated system up in low Earth orbit with a reusable satellite, and then to bring your products back down to Earth. This is a very bold concept, an idea of embarking on manufacturing some unique and incredibly valuable products in low Earth orbit without having to put 
these products on a space station or relying on the assistance of astronauts or anything else. Both Varda and Space Forge intend to make use of new cutting-edge reusable satellites and new types of heat shields as well in order to make manufacturing in space not only practical, but also very affordable. And when you consider that the types of materials, drugs, etc., that can be manufactured in microgravity sometimes carry a price tag of over a million dollars per kilogram, these can be very, very lucrative missions indeed. And so Rocket Lab, with this unique partnership, is in on the ground floor of both in-space manufacturing and also cutting-edge reusability at the same time, something that is doubtlessly going to produce a lot of revenue for this small company. Well, not so small anymore, but when we're talking about this clandestine mission that took place only a few days ago, well, it's very apparent as to why Rocket Lab decided to move their headquarters to the United States, because this is the sort of mission that U.S. military contractors would never have permitted with a company that was based any place aside from the U.S. And the reason I'm going to be showing you still photos with all of these new funky animation techniques that I have on my editing system, well, it's because I don't have any footage. No one was allowed to take any footage. Even NASA spaceflight, at least to my knowledge, didn't get anything aside from still shots. The suborbital booster in question is called the Hypersonic Accelerator Suborbital Test Electron, or HASTE. It lifted off on Saturday, June 17th at 9.24 Eastern Daylight Time from Rocket Lab's Launch Complex 2 at Virginia's Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport Facility at NASA's Wallops Flight Facility. What's important and unique about this launch is the fact that Rocket Lab only gave vague indications as to when they were going to launch this thing. They gave no notice whatsoever to much of anybody except perhaps the FAA and just lifted off without a great deal of fanfare. Now you will notice that at the tail end of this launch, the rocket changed trajectory. You can see it very obviously here. And that indicates that there was some sort of payload on board that had to be deployed into a suborbital trajectory, suggesting that there might have been some sort of hyper Sonic test article on the rocket, or perhaps they just were carrying out this unique trajectory in order to prove the concept in the first place to future hypersonic customers. Regardless of the reasons, the test was an unqualified success, according to Peter Beck, CEO of Rocket Lab. The vehicle apparently involves a modified third stage for suborbital payload deployments, and unlike just about every other electron launch, this thing can carry a a fairly substantial payload, up to 700 kilograms or 1,540 pounds. That's a pretty sizable hypersonic test vehicle that it can carry up. And this is something that was appreciated by an Australian company called Hypersonics, a company that intends to build suborbital and orbital space planes capable of hypersonic speeds. But why do you need a rocket booster to launch a hypersonic space plane in the first place? Peace. Well, most hypersonic engines, whether they be ramjets, scramjets, or something else, make use of the forward motion of the engine in order to produce thrust. It produces no thrust when stationary, which means it requires an assisted takeoff, like a rocket for example, in order to accelerate it to the necessary speed to where it starts to produce thrust. Therefore, Rocket Lab Suborbital Electron is a perfect booster to carry out this type of mission. However, it's very interesting interesting that Rocket Lab is the one securing these contracts and not a company like SpaceX or ULA. There might be something unique about the Electron configuration, or it's just a lot less expensive to launch one of these things. Regardless of the reasons, Rocket Lab has now secured extremely high-paying military customers from around the world as a result of this new and unique suborbital booster. This is something that perhaps Blue Origin 
Origin could have done something with with their new Shepard rocket, but they didn't seem to pay attention to the opportunities. Instead, Rocket Lab is offering all types of alternatives for air breathing systems, ballistic reentry systems, boost glide systems, or simply hypersonic vehicles capable of reaching orbit. And because of this unique new system, Rocket Lab now has the capability of delivering more than double the payload they used to be able to, assuming that they use a hypersonic vehicle to assist in the deployment, so they can deploy up to 700 kilograms to orbit now instead of 300, giving them a substantially improved capability before they finally introduce the Neutron, perhaps in 2024 or 2025. And so now, in a single stroke, Rocket Lab has put themselves on the cutting edge of space manufacturing and hypersonic technology in the same year with two consecutive launches. It's impressive, and it demonstrates that this company from New Zealand is now becoming a key competitor in the space launch industry. And not just space launch, but in everything associated with space flight. Smash that like, hit that subscribe, please check the description for various ways to support my content so I can keep bringing this to you in the future, and as always, stay angry about space!